in the previous video we talked about what happens to the food in the mouth esophagus and the stomach we left off here uh, where the food was in the stomach and it was getting partially digested now in today's video we are going to talk about what happens to the food after it exits the stomach and reaches the small intestine and then after that it goes to the large intestine so the food in the stomach that is now thoroughly mixed with hydrochloric acid and is acidic in nature is known as chyme and it is this chyme that enters the small intestine it is the pyloric sphincter which controls the release of chyme from the stomach into the small intestine now let's see what happens to the food in the small intestine so although it's called the small intestine it's not at all small in fact it's quite long around 22 meters or 7 feet long then why is it called the small intestine well because the diameter the diameter of the small intestine is small compared to the diameter of the large intestine you might be wondering if it is 22 meters or 7 feet long how does it fit in our body that's because it is highly compacted it has a lot of curves and twists and turns and it is highly compacted to fit within our abdomen so the small intestine has three parts The first part of the small intestine that receives chyme from the stomach is known as the duodenum. The next part is the jejunum and the last part is the ileum. The ileum is the part that pushes food from the small intestine to the large intestine. Now the main function of the small intestine is the complete digestion of food and the absorption of nutrients. So this entire process takes place in the small intestine. Food entering the small intestine has proteins that are partially digested and carbohydrates that are partially digested, right? But the complete digestion of proteins, carbohydrates and fats happens in the small intestine. How does that happen? The small intestine takes help from the pancreas and the liver, which are the accessory organs. So the pancreas produces pancreatic enzymes that are capable of completely digesting proteins carbohydrates and fats like you have proteases for proteins amylases for carbohydrates and lipases for fats so what the proteases will do is it will break the proteins into amino acids amylases will break carbohydrates into glucose and other simple sugars lipases will break fats into glycerol and fatty acids but there is a problem We just saw that the chyme that is entering the small intestine is acidic in nature but for these pancreatic enzymes to work the duodenum needs a slightly alkaline environment and for that alkaline environment the pancreas secretes bicarbonate what bicarbonate does is that it neutralizes the acidic chyme and imparts a slightly alkaline nature to the duodenum so now the chyme and the duodenum is slightly alkaline which is what is needed for the pancreatic enzymes to function and in the alkaline environment proteases and amylases can easily digest proteins and carbohydrates but for fats even then lipases cannot directly digest fats in the duodenum for fat digestion to happen the fat has to be emulsified and emulsification is a process that is carried out by bile now bile is a substance that is secreted by the liver it is made up of bile salts bilirubin and water and bile is important to emulsify fats and once it is emulsified the fats can be broken down by lipases even though it is the liver that secretes bile it is stored in the gall bladder and whenever needed the gall bladder releases the bile into the duodenum where the complete digestion of food is taking place So the process by which the food is completely digested and the nutrients are absorbed is known as assimilation and assimilation is what takes place in the small intestine the digestion of food may take place in the duodenum but the absorption process continues as the food passes through the jejunum and the ileum as well so the entirety of the small intestine is involved in the assimilation process but how exactly does that assimilation process work how are nutrients absorbed by the blood well that is done with the help of intestinal villi now the lumen of the small intestine what is the lumen 
we saw that the gastrointestinal tract is just a hollow tube, right? So the hollow part of the tube is known as the lumen. And the lumen of the small intestine is lined with tiny projections, thousands of tiny projections known as villi. And each of these tiny projections have even more tinier projections known as microvilli. So what is the function of this villi and microvilli? Say you have a flat surface and the nutrients are coming here. Then the bloodstream that is going here only has so much surface area to absorb the nutrients. But say if there are projections on this surface like this and even more projections like this. There is just an increased surface area now for the blood vessels to come and pick up the nutrients. So that is the function of the villi and the microvilli. They increase the surface area for nutrient absorption. This is well and good because the villi are supplied with a rich supply of blood vessels. The increased surface area allows for nutrients to be picked up from the lumen into the bloodstream. From the small intestine, the blood vessels here, they transport the nutrients to the liver first. And from the liver, they are then transported to all parts of the body. This is known as the hepatic portal system. Hepatic refers to the liver. So now in the small intestine, whatever food that can be digested is completely digested. So what food moves to the large intestine is the undigested food. Let's take a look at what happens to the food in the large intestine which can be thought of as the final part of the digestive system. So like I said, the large intestine receives undigested food from the small intestine. The major function of the large intestine is to absorb water. You see, in the small intestine, although nutrients are absorbed majorly, only a small portion of water from the food is absorbed. Our body also needs a lot of water, right? Whatever water can be absorbed from the food is done at the large intestine. And there are also several good bacteria that make up our gut microbiome. And these gut bacteria, they have a symbiotic relationship with our body. The large intestine gives them a place to live and nutrients to survive. In return, they are involved in producing vitamins like vitamin B2 and vitamin K. So these bacteria produce the vitamins in the large intestine and then they are absorbed from the large intestine into the bloodstream. So that is another function of the large intestine, producing vitamins like vitamin B2 and vitamin K. The body also doesn't like to waste any nutrients, any resources. So any reabsorption of nutrients that can take place happens in the large intestine. So that whatever leaves our body, whatever undigested food is leaving our body is completely devoid of nutrients. So the final mass that is at the last part of the large intestine that has now been completely absorbed of water and nutrients is known as feces. And it is the feces that is excreted through the anus. The feces is initially stored in the rectum until a certain amount of feces is stored after which the rectum starts to put pressure on the anus. The feces moves from the rectum to the anus by the method of peristalsis. We already saw in the previous video peristalsis is the contraction and relaxation of the smooth muscles, right? So peristalsis is what pushes the food from the rectum to the anus and out through the body. And the process by which we excrete these feces from our anus is known as defecation. So we can say that the food spends around 4 to 5 hours in the small intestine where the food is completely digested and the nutrients are absorbed. But the entire process of digestion that began in the mouth and is ending in the anus could take around 10 to 40 hours to completely take place the entire process of digestion. And this is how the digestive system is just one hollow tube that began in the mouth and is ending in the anus.